So in unit six, we're looking at um, algebraic expressions and variables and stuff. So we want to make sure we have a strong grasp of the terminology that we're going to be seeing and experiencing in this unit. And our first term to look at is the word variable. And what does what is a variable? What does it mean? So a variable is a letter that is used as a placeholder for an unknown value. Okay. So if I have something like a two plus X, okay, I don't know what I want to add with two, but once I'm either told what it is or I'm told pick whatever you want, I can plug that number in and then solve. But in the meantime, I have a variable to hold the place of a number until I know what it's supposed to be worth. Okay, so that's our purpose of it. It gives us oftentimes something to solve Four. It gives us a purpose for our, our math problems, okay? The next thing to look at is what we're looking at right here, and this is an expression. So an expression is a mathematical operation that has a, a some operation occurring, but there is no equal sign, okay? So I have a two, I have an addition problem between these two numbers. This is an expression, no equal sign. I can't solve this. I can't find out what X is until I'm either told what X is and I can plug in and find my answer or I'm told what this is supposed to equal and then be able to solve for X. So as it is, it's just there, okay? Uh, we've seen the, ex uh, the expressions length times width. That's an expression. Whatever length is, multiplying it by width. As the operation is multiplication, there we go. Um, so there are some things that we should be aware of in how expressions are written, just to make sure we're following with the proper format for algebra. One is whenever we are being asked to multiply a variable by anything, we do not use a multiplication sign. It's not necessary. The rules of algebra say whatever number or variable is touching another variable, it means those values get multiplied by. So if I had, if, if the phrase even said two times or uh, a number twice or something, so a number, and this is oftentimes in phrases how we refer to a variable, we just call it a number. We don't know what it is but that's what we call it. And we use an X to express it, a number twice, okay? So that it would be saying that I have something twice, which means I would be multiplying it by two. Just because a number is said first in the phrase and it's getting multiplied by two, I do not go X times two or X parentheses two or parentheses X parentheses two, we don't do that. The rule of algebraic format is we always put the number in multiplication first when it's being multiplied by a variable. So the two goes first, and then the variable it's being multiplied by goes right after it with no symbols in between. This is saying twice X's value. All right, and the number on our variable is called a coefficient. A coefficient, okay? Um, then, so, and you could even have, if you had X times Y times three, you wouldn't write it like that. Even if it showed you that, you would clean it up by saying, oh, the number has to go first, and then, um, and then you would be multiplying it by the X and Y. So then within an expression, if I had, I could even have two X plus three, okay? In this case, I have actually multiplication and an addition going on, but each one of these individual values is called a term. So two X is a term and three is a term because this is considered one value. This is considered another value. Okay, so those are our terms. We can, there's really no limit to how many terms we can have. I have 
I can have um, 3x plus y minus 7, um, 7, brain farting now, um, minus 12. Okay, in this case, each one of these values is a term, 3x, y, negative 7, negative 12. And the negatives do get included on the number that it's with, okay? Uh, then, again, we can't solve expressions until we're given a value for our variable. So sometimes we might see, actually, I'll get that to that later, that's a solution part. Then if we had 2 plus x, but now we have an equaling five. This, on the other hand, is now an equation. Previously, we had an expression where there's no equal sign. An equation has an equal sign. And this says that what is on one side is worth the exact same amount as what is on the other. Side A does not create side B, but they are worth the exact same amount. It's like having four quarters and one dollar. The four quarters does not create the dollar. It's they're both, they exist separately, um, but it's just a different way of expressing the exact same quantity. When we are given equations, we are then, we have enough information to find out what the solution to that would be, what X has to be to make both those sides the same. Okay, um, and that would get us down to finding the solution to the equation. And the way this works out, is um, we have what's called the addition property, okay? So we use either addition or subtraction to be able to solve for our unknown value, okay? And what our goal is when solving an equation is to isolate X. We want it on its own side of the equal sign. We want it all by itself. Well, what? value, what term is in the way of the X being alone? This positive two. I don't want a positive two on this side. I want that to be worth zero. So because this is a positive two, I do the opposite operation to it to cancel it out. I combine it with a negative two. So now that cancels out. But if I do that on the left, I also have to do that on the right so that my proportions are all working out the same. So when I have a five and I take away two, I get three on one side and X is now all alone. So this it's saying that the solution for X or the solution to this equation is three. When we solve for X, it's really good. Something simple like this, we know, yeah, no, of course it's gonna be three. Two plus three is five. When it's more complicated, it is very important that you are plugging in your solution into your equation and double checking that it is equal on both sides, that both sides are equivalent. Okay. Um, so that is the starters. If I had uh, an X minus seven equaling 12. Okay. Again, my goal is to get X by itself. What term is in the way of that? A negative seven. So instead of to get a zero here, I have to do the opposite operation to that negative seven. Instead of subtracting seven, I have to add seven and I have to do it to both sides. So that cancels out, leaving me with a lone X on the left. And then I can go 12 plus seven to get 19. Then I verify that that was the solution to my equation by saying 19 minus seven is that equal, equal to 12? Yes, it is. So that works. That is the solution to my equation. So I showed you already the proper way to show multiplication. Okay. If I have, let's go 3x equals 21. Okay. And I want to be able to solve this equation. I need to find the solution to this equation. What? When our numbers are small enough, we can maybe mental math it. Three times what gives me 21? I'm not totally sure. We want to make sure we have the algebraic process down pat so that we can solve this on more complicated things. So we practice on the easy ones so that we make this basically a muscle memory on the process for when it gets a little more complicated. So 
Just like before with the addition property, my goal is I need to get the X by itself. There is no other term on this side except the three on the X. The operation that is currently occurring here is a multiplying three by X. So to get the three off of the X, I have to do the opposite operation. This is called the multiplication property, where we're either multiplying or dividing on both sides to be able to isolate our X. So if I have a three X, I need to divide it by three because any number divided by itself turns into a one. And if I have an X, one time, it means I just have an X. We never leave a one in front of our X because if, if I see one there, it means one exists. So why put an, a one in front of it? It's just redundant. So if I divide by three on the left, I have to divide by three on the right. So then if I go 21 divided by three and I get that that's seven, I double check, does that work as a solution? If I go three and I multiply that by seven, is that equal to 21? Yep, so there is our solution. So we looked at how multiplication is shown in algebra. Well, there's also a way that we show division. We don't show it as say 15 divided by three anymore, we use the fraction bar to show division. So this would be written as 15 over three because this bar means the division process, okay? So if we have um, 30, mm, let's, let's try, actually let's go X over five and it's supposed to be equal to 45. Okay, so this is saying I have some number divided by five and it is 45. I did not mean, I'm going to change this number. I'm going to change that number. That was not the number I was going for, actually. Uh, let's take it down to a seven. Okay, so I have some number and I can subtract five out of it seven times. What is that number? We can probably mental math that, but again, we take the simple processes, the simple numbers to get an understanding of the process we apply so that we know what to do when it's tougher. So because this is saying I'm supposed to take X and divide it by five to get the X by itself, I need to get rid of the five. Well, because it currently says divide by five, I have to do the opposite of that. And now I need to multiply by five. So I need to multiply both sides of the equation by five. I need to make that look higher, otherwise it looks like a decimal. There we go. So when I do that, I have a whole number times a fraction. That's a no-no. So we turn it into that whole number into a fraction. Now, if I look at it, I have a five and a five across from each other. Let's cancel out. Because five divided by five turns into one. Five divided by five turns into one. So I have X over one. Any number over one is just itself, right? So by doing that, that lets me just get the X alone. So then I can go over here and figure out, well, what's seven times five? It's gonna be 35. So the solution to my equation is 35. And all a solution is, is the value for the X that makes the statement true. What do I plug in for X that makes this, this statement true, okay? Um, and this can even happen when we have X on the bottom. Something to be aware of though, generally, we don't like our X in the division problem. We like it on the side. So if I have X divided by five, that means I have X and I'm trying to break it into five pieces. How much is each piece worth? That means I'm trying to find one piece of this. So I'm trying to find one fifth of X. So generally when we are working with trying to divide X by something, we write it as a multiplication statement. It's fraction value with the X on the side so that we have a number to work with. Just something to be aware of. You'll need to know that for your next level class. Okay. 
Well, what if we have, I'm going to go 81 divided by x equals 9. Again, I have a division problem. And I can't clear the 81 off because 81 isn't doing anything. It's there. Guess what's being done to it? It's trying to be divided by x. So we have to do the same thing we previously did when we have a division process. To get that off of there, I have to multiply both sides by whatever I was trying to divide by. This is going to be a little funky. But it's going to then end up making me cancel out the x's on the left. Okay, it goes away there. So now it's not a part of a division. So I'm left with an 81, and it equals 9 times an x. Well, how do we write 9 times a number? We write it as 9x. Now we got to get the x by itself. Okay, now that x isn't a part of a division process, our goal is I got to get this alone. What is in the way of it being by itself? This 9, this multiplying with a 9. So to get the 9 off of the x, I have to do the opposite operation, which is divide by 9. So when I divide by 9, that lets me cancel those out to just leave an x behind. And if I take 81 and I divide it by 9, I get nine, so nine is the solution. And I double check, does that work if I plug in nine for X? So if I go 81 and I divide it by nine, do I get nine? Yep, so nine is the solution. But just know that in writing with division, we don't use the division symbol anymore. We, we write everything as a fraction. The distributive property is a very handy dandy little multiplication tool uh, that you will be using throughout the rest of your math classes. Okay. Um, and the setup is okay. So, say I, I'm making a little goodie baskets for my kids' birthday party. And in each basket, I need there to be um, maybe uh, one pack of bubbles. Okay. So, one bubble. All right, and I want three gumballs, and I want uh, two rings, two candy rings. All right, and I'm expecting 13 kids at this party. Don't know why I picked 13. Let's make it 15. 15 makes more sense. Okay, uh, actually, it doesn't make even more sense. I'm going with doesn't. Okay. Uh, it's a thing that you use every day and you don't realize it exactly. So I have this occurring in each gift basket and I need 12 of these. So this is going to let me figure out how much of each I need. This is set up in the distributive property format. What is my baseline individual quantity and how many times do I need that? The rule is whatever is in front of the parentheses is multiplying and distributing to each individual term within the parentheses. So this 12 distributes and multiplies by the B. If I have 12 Bs, how much do I have? I have 12 B. If I have 12, if I have 3 G, 12 times 12 times 3 is going to give me 36 of these G's. And then if I have 12 times 2, I get 24 R. So this lets me know how much I have of each individual element because it had to be done 12 times. So this is the distributive property. Anything in front of the parentheses is multiplying by each one of the terms. It's the same idea of when we had a negative in front of anything. Um, two plus, say we'll say two plus x. If we have a, did I do inverses in here? Pretty sure I did in our integer section. Um, so if I needed a number, I could think of this as a negative one. 
a negative one times a positive two turns into a negative two. A negative one times a positive X turns into a negative X. So when we have a parentheses with a negative in front, this is called the inverse or opposite of. And this idea just lets me switch all the signs because whatever's outside is multiplying by everything inside. It did not have to do with anything with the top. Uh, or sorry, I started recording when I didn't think I was. Uh, so uh, earlier when I had that, the this two plus x, this did not connect to this. This was a whole new separate uh, entity, different example of the distributive property. So what we would call this. This would, this would be the simplified form of this expression. Again, this is an expression because there are no equal signs involved. This is just the simplified form of this distributive uh, factored out expression. These two might look different, but they are worth the exact same amount because they look different but are equal in value, that means these are equivalent expressions, okay? Um, just like if I had, you know, a group of kids went to the movie theater and everybody got um, a bag of popcorn, uh, actually let's go with a, a ticket and two popcorns because they really like popcorn. A ticket plus two popcorns and 13 kids participated in that. What was our total, okay? So when we distribute the 13 to the T, I get 13 T. When I distribute the 13 to the two, I get 26 P. These are representing the exact same amount. This form, this factored out form like this, is letting me see what each individual group is made up of and then how many of those groups exist. Okay, so each, this was an individual element and how many individuals are partaking in that. This, sometimes you don't need to know what each person is getting. You just care about in the end, how much do I need to get all together to meet the needs of everybody? I only care how many tickets do I need to buy? How many popcorns do I need to buy? I don't care how many each individual person is getting. I just need to cover my basis, okay? So equivalent, just one form is giving you information that another might not be. This is kind of an individual basis. This is a group basis. When we are asked to evaluate an expression, the word evaluate means go ahead and solve it. We can only evaluate an expression if we are told what X is worth. Now that we know what X is worth, we plug it into the equation to be able to find out what is our end value? What is our result? It is essential, essential that when you are replacing a variable with what it's worth, you are doing that inside of the parentheses. So this four is getting multiplied. So wherever there is a variable, just go through, write, replace it with parentheses and write all the numbers around it. Then you can grab that value and plunk it in. Okay, so now I have a four times a negative one. Positive times a negative is a negative. Four times one is one, so I mean, or four times one is four. So I have a negative four here. So if I have a negative four, and a negative one, because my signs are the same, I'm going to go ahead and combine them. I'm going to add the numbers together and keep the sign the same. If I owe four and I owe a dollar, it means I owe five. It doesn't mean I have five. The signs only cancel out when there is multiplication involved. So negative five is the solution to my expression here. Or, uh, no, I'm sorry, uh, five is the solution to, to my equation when I, I plug it in, okay? Here, again, whenever we have a variable, we replace it in parentheses, plug in everything, and then I take that value and I plop it in side of the parentheses. And 
all of you should know what this means. What is a negative three evaluated? Which means what is the solution to negative three squared? It's three times, well, it's a negative three times a negative three because with the parentheses that, that negative is involved in the exponent. And so yes, negative three times a negative three, you bet. And so that evaluates to a negative times negative is a positive. Three times three is nine. So I go nine plus five to get a final value to my equation, a solution to my equation of 14. So that was the, that was the solution. All right, so this might be a repetition of what I just did. I had a little error in recording and I just wanna make sure everybody knows what to do. We must make sure that we are replacing a variable in parentheses. So that especially when a negative is involved so that we handle this appropriately because the negative three is in parentheses. This negative, this two for an exponent is connected to both the three and the negative. So a negative three times a negative three leaves me with a positive nine plus five to get 14. If I had just taken this and plopped the three into where the X was, that would have left me with a negative three squared plus five. Well, a negative three without the parentheses squared means a three times a three, which is a nine, and the negative sign just dropped down to add, to stay on it. And then we add the five and negative nine, positive five leaves me with negative four. So get in the habit, always replace a variable with parentheses and then plug the number in. It might not always be necessary, especially if it's a positive number, but it just makes sure you're covering your bases. I cannot tell you how many times people have messed up because they it didn't plug in the parentheses and so they miscalculated things. So just get, get in that habit. Um, also, it would be kind of confusing if you had something like, um, let's see if I had X, Y, where X is two and Y is um, six, okay? If I didn't have parentheses and I just plop the number in, oh, X is two, Y is six, so it's worth 26. It is the value of X multiplied by the value of six. So I would need, and even if I didn't put, I guess, this one in parentheses, you definitely have to have the Y in there so that I'm showing a two is getting multiplied by a six to get a 12. So just get that. Parentheses are your friends. 